Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open and be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. Greetings. My name is Jeff Ross. I'm one of the associate pastors here at the Roswell United Methodist Church. I look forward to sharing with you this message. Uh, we're going to start with the third chapter of the book of Exodus, verses 1 through 10. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in flames of fire from within the bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire, but it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And then Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place that you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of the people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Let us pray. God, guide these words, guide this scripture as we look at it today to speak to us and open our eyes and our hearts uh, that we might see you more clearly uh, and be able to follow your guidance and your leading in our lives. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. This is an interesting passage, uh, this story of uh, the burning bush and of Moses and his journey. 
Uh, it comes on the heels of Genesis where uh, the people of Israel have flourished. They've done a great job, Jacob and Joseph and Abraham and all of their families. At the end of the book of Genesis, the, uh, Joseph helps get, save the nation of Israel by bringing them to Egypt uh, so they can escape the drought. And, uh, and, and so as we pick it up in Exodus, there's a new king. It's about 500 years after the death of Joseph. Uh, and nobody remembers how friendly all of those folks were. The Israelites now have become a pretty significant group. And the current Pharaoh believes they're a threat to the kingdom. So they've put them in slavery. Uh, and... Moses, in the beginning of the book of Exodus, has had a miraculous birth and, and being saved from the edict to kill the children under two years old. Uh, but as he grew up, he had an encounter with some Egyptians. One of them got killed. Uh, Moses flees. And uh, Moses has found a new home, and in this land he's comfortable, he has a family, uh, he has a, he's making a good living, uh, he's part of a pretty prominent family, uh, and he's doing well. And so when we pick up this story, all that background of where Moses is now and how he's doing uh, plays into it. And so it says in verse 1 that he's tending the flock, which is uh, interesting because that's where uh, God finds David uh, in the book of Samuel. It's where uh, God finds the shepherds in the story of uh, Christmas Eve from Luke chapter 2. Um, and so uh, God seems to like uh, encountering people as they're tending their flocks. And the angel appears to Moses, but, uh, but the angel's in a, a speaking from a bush that's on fire, but it's not being consumed. And so you get the impression from the story that it's over there, that Moses notices it, but he doesn't jump to run over and check it out. It's almost like he's looking at it. Maybe he knows that God might be up to something. He, he's not sure he wants a part of it. But it says that after a while, uh, he sees this strange sight, a strange sight indeed. Uh, and he says he'll go over and take a look. When he gets over, it's only then as he walks over to the bush that God speaks to him. It's as if God is waiting, being patient, uh, seeing if Moses will take the bait. Uh, Moses walks over there uh, and God says, Moses, Moses. And then in verses 5 through 10, God tells Moses the story about how he's concerned about the Israelites. They're being oppressed. He's going to rescue them. And then in verse 10, he says to Moses, and you're the guy. I've anointed you. I've called you. I've elevated you to this wonderful position of saving the uh, Israelite people. Well, you know, maybe to most of us, that would be exciting. It would be something we'd jump at the chance to do. We see all through the Bible where people jump at the chance to follow God when he calls and uh, uh, appears to them in some miraculous way. But Moses doesn't appear to do that. Moses doesn't seem all that passionately mournful uh, over the plight of the Israelites. He's, again, he's in a comfortable place. He's making a good living. He's got a new family. He knows that uh, he's a wanted man back in Egypt, and so it's probably pretty safe to stay where he is. Uh, and as God outlines this plan, he doesn't seem like he's all that keen to take on this challenge. Uh, and that's way different than other people in the Bible. If you go uh, up to the book of Nehemiah chapter 1, uh, and the story of Nehemiah, Nehemiah is uh, one of the Israelites that's in exile in Babylon. Uh, the Babylonians and Persians have laid waste to Jerusalem, uh, and uh, some friends come to see Nehemiah, and he asks how Jerusalem is getting along. They tell him that it's, it's not good, Nehemiah. Things are bad there. And so it says in chapter, in verse 4 of that first chapter of Nehemiah, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned, I fasted, and I prayed to the God of heaven. Wow. Wow. He's really broken up over the plight of uh, the uh, Israelites that are still back in uh, Jerusalem. But not so much the same response from Moses. Uh, in Psalm 137 verse 1, 
uh, some of the Israelites are lamenting over the plight of Jerusalem in verse 1 of Psalm 137 says, by the waters of Babylon, we sat down and wept uh, when we remembered Zion. So Moses is reluctant. Is that the best word to to say? Moses doesn't seem all that passionate about the plight of the Israelites. And he also doesn't seem all that passionate about his belief in his own ability to be the leader. And so uh, we read uh, chapter 3, verse 1 through 10. If you pick it up in verse 11 and read through chapter 4 and verse 17, there's this fascinating dialogue between God and Moses. And so God's trying to convince Moses to be this great leader, and Moses comes up with all the excuses of why he can't. I don't know in your encounters with God as you listen to God and as you pray and as you feel like God is asking you to do something or leading you down a path, maybe you've had that same battle. I'm, I'm not good enough. I don't know about this. I'm not sure I want to do this. Uh, I'm not sure this is the right thing for me. Uh, maybe you have that conversation with your spouse or your minister or a good friend that I don't know if I want to teach this class. I don't know if I want to do this thing. I don't know if I want to go on this mission trip. I'm just not cut out for that sort of thing. We have all these excuses. And this is a fascinating conversation between God and Moses. Verse 11 uh, of chapter 3, Moses says, who, who am I? I'm nobody. I don't have any gifts, skills, abilities. I'm not, God, I'm, I'm just not your guy. Well, God goes through all these things he's going to give Moses, tools, resources to help him. And then uh, chapter 4, verse 1, Moses says, well, well what, if, what if they don't believe me? What, what, what do I do then? What if they don't listen to me? What am I going to say? How am I going to convince them? Uh, it continues in verse 1. What if they say to me, God didn't appear to you. You're making all this up. Moses is just, he's, he's just not getting on board with what God is wanting to do. And you can see in the, the dialogue that God's getting more and more frustrated. So he goes back over the things he's going to give him, the resources, the tools. Uh, he's going to be able to convince Pharaoh. He's going to stand up to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's going to back down. God's going to lead these people and, and everything's going to be great. And Moses is going to be the one to do all this. And Moses, verse 10 of chapter 4 says... But, but I'm just not a good speaker. I, I'm not good in front of people. Uh, and, uh, and then in verse 13, Moses says, God, just, just send somebody else. I, I just, you know, thanks for the offer, but I, I just don't want to do it. Well, verse 14 of chapter 4 is a hysterical verse. It says, the Lord's anger burned against Moses. God's so frustrated. But finally uh, gets Moses some help and keeps after him. Moses finally relents and says that he'll do this thing. Well, that's, that's way different. Again, I, I don't know, maybe your experience is that you kind of argued with God. Other folks just jump right in. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, it says, uh, Isaiah says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And Isaiah jumps right up, first person to jump up and says, Lord, here I am, send me. Isaiah is eager. He's ready to go. He doesn't know if he has the gifts, the skills, abilities, but he's ready to go. God needs help. I'm I'm your guy, God. Same thing in uh, Luke, the gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 38, uh, the angel comes to Mary and explains all these things that are going to happen to Mary. And Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. Again, Mary's just a young girl at this point. I am the Lord's servant, Mary said. May it be to me as you have said. May it be to me as you have said. So, uh, you know, maybe you're in one of those places, eager to help God or reluctant. Um, but that's why it's uh, helpful to hear these stories and, and to see how God works with us in different ways. Burning bushes and angels coming in the middle of the night are, are not the norm. Uh, the, I, the norm is for something really much more subtle. Uh, maybe you heard God's voice speaking to you at a camp or at a worship service like this or on a mission trip or during vacation Bible school or a youth retreat. 
uh, or teaching a class or listening to a song or just reading the Bible uh, or just sitting out uh, on the beach uh, one morning as the sun comes up. We, we hear God's voice and, and feel God's leading in different ways. But often our response is similar to Moses in that we start thinking of all the reasons uh, you're, I'm not a good choice. I'm, I'm not equipped. I'm not ready. I'm not knowledgeable. Uh, I'm not gifted. Um, I'm not good enough. All kinds of reasons sometimes we think to keep us from from doing what God calls us to do. And so uh, it's interesting that God doesn't call the equipped. It's not always the most prominent person, the best educated that God calls, but God does equip those he calls. Uh, God's power through the Holy Spirit uh, comes in us leads us, guides us, gives us ability, talent, power, uh, resources that we didn't even know that we had, gives us the ability, helps us call to, to mind uh, scripture and stories and, and illustrations that we don't even know where they came from uh, to help us to speak and to guide, to lead, to witness, to do the things that God has called us to do. Hebrews uh, Chapter 13, verse 20 and 21 says, Now may the peace of God equip you with everything good that you may be able to do his will, working in you which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Matthew chapter 4 says pretty much the same thing. Chapter 4, verse 19, Peter is um, being called by, by Jesus to be one of the disciples. And Peter's a fisherman, and again, like Moses, has a lot of excuses why he wouldn't be good. Uh, and over the course of Peter's ministry, uh, is often uh, trying to, to explain that he's just not good enough. But Jesus says to Peter and to you and me, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You see in that story and in, in those verses that God is equipping us. God is giving us abilities uh, that are beyond maybe our belief in ourselves. God, God sees more in us, believes more about us than we often ever believe in ourselves. Uh, God believes we can do things that sometimes we don't think we're able to do. And a lot of times that's because uh, of our past or things we know about ourselves. We just don't think that we're good enough. There on the screen uh, is a, 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 a little chart uh, that talks about some of the people in the Bible. It says that Noah was a drunk. Abraham was too old. Jacob was a liar. Uh, Moses had a stuttering problem. Uh, Gideon was afraid, Elijah was suicidal, Jonah ran from God, uh, Job went bankrupt, Peter denied Jesus, the, the disciples fell asleep while praying, Paul was too religious, and Lazarus was dead. Um, I, I, I like that. I think, you know, if Lazarus, who was dead, can be used of God in mighty ways, then maybe there's hope for all of us. Moses has this interesting reluctance uh, to follow God, uh, to jump in, uh, and even throughout his ministry, he seemed a little reluctant. Uh, maybe uh, not a great self-image, uh, maybe feeling like other people were, were better equipped. Um, and, and sometimes we fall into that category too. But I want to take you back to a, uh, a one chapter, to the second chapter, and, and look at a story there, the story of Moses' sister, uh, and to show you the opportunity that, that we all have when we pay attention, when we read the room well, 
when, we, uh, when we're looking for opportunities to help one another. Maybe, maybe we're not even thinking about serving God. Maybe we just have a passion for a friend, a fellow student, a neighbor, a coworker, uh, and we're, we're concerned about their well-being, their healing, their health, and, and, and just want to know what we can do to help. The this, this story's fascinating. In the second chapter of Exodus, uh, the very beginning, first 10 verses, is the story of Moses. Uh, parents have a little boy. Uh, and at that time, Pharaoh has passed a law that says all male Israelite children must be put to death under two years old. And so, uh, because they're becoming too numerous and they're a threat to the national security of, of Egypt. And so Moses' parents have this boy. They keep him for three months. They don't know what to do with him. They're, they, they know that if they keep him much longer, uh, he's going to be found out by the soldiers and put to death. So they're, they're trying to save his life. They're trying to do the right thing by Moses. The only thing they can think to do is to put him in a basket and put him in the river. And so it says in verse 4 of that second chapter of Exodus that his sister, Moses' sister, stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. And that's all we, ha we have uh, uh, background. Uh, we know that Moses' sister has to be six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve 10, 12 years old, something like that, no more than that. Uh, and she's had to have heard the long evening discussions of Moses' parents about what are they going to do with this boy, uh, her brother. Uh, she has to be concerned too. She knows this day is coming. She's heard her parents' plan. Uh, she's trying to figure out. It doesn't say that she's asked to do this or uh, she's been planted. It doesn't say anything. So reading a lot into the story, maybe she's just concerned for her parents or love for her brother, uh, believing that God, she's heard the stories of Genesis and Jacob and Abraham, and believing that God is going to do something, can do something, would do something. So she follows at a distance to see, just see what happens to this little child. She's not playing with her toys up in her room. She's not absorbed in herself. She's, uh, she sees a need, and even at this young age, is, is wanting to find something to do, a way to help. So she, she follows the, the basket as it floats down the Nile. And then it says in verse 7 that the, uh, the servant of Pharaoh's daughter sees the basket, picks it up, notices it's a child, takes it over to Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, what should we do with it? Uh, she says, let's keep it. And at that point, verse 7, this little sister speaks up. She addresses the, the, the daughter of Pharaoh. She's not afraid. She's not scared. She's bold. Uh, she wants to help. And she says, shall I, this is the sister Shall I go get one of the uh, Israelite women, Hebrew women, to nurse him? Pharaoh's daughter says, yes, that's a great idea. And so Moses' sister goes and gets her mother, Moses' mom and her mom, and brings her to Pharaoh's daughter uh, so that she might raise this child. Gosh, that's an incredible story. Uh, imagine the joy. Maybe the mom and dad had started walking back to the house. Uh, the, uh, the daughter runs and gets her mom. Mom, guess what? Come here. Uh, it's an incredible story of somebody wanting to help, believing against all hope that something good might come. You know, we do have that power. Uh, not because it's our power, not because it's our ability, but because God is working in us, as the passage in Hebrews said, uh, that, that God, through the Holy Spirit, works in us to do things, lead in ways that we can never imagine. Uh, and maybe you've experienced that in some places. You've taught a class, you've gone on a mission trip, you've helped somebody, and you said, wow, where did I get that? Well, that's how God is at work in your life and in my life, in the life of the church. As somebody has an idea about a way to help people and other folks come alongside of that and make it a reality. It's the power of God at work in you and me. I don't know where God might be speaking in your life today. 
or, or where God might be speaking in your life a week from now, a year from now. But I know that as we listen and pay attention and look beyond ourselves to the world around us, God can use that kind of heart to do great things. Let us pray. Gracious God, we, we thank you for your goodness, for your love for us, for the ways in which you work in our lives and our hearts. Use us. That's a, that's a powerful thing to think about, that you would use us, that you have given us gifts and abilities no matter where we have come from. We give you thanks. Guide us, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you wanna see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 11.15 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We wanna be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words of a benediction. Love without fear, serve with commitment. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.